friends welcome back to the first vlog of 2024 happy new year if this is the time of year you celebrate your new year i just finished filming my best books of 2023 which you would have seen um and yeah wanted to start a vlog uh had a really chill new year with our neighborhood besties they cooked homemade pasta a la norma it was very delicious and we watched the fireworks if you're not okay with the Amsterdam New Year's traditions which perhaps you aren't but we have a very extreme version of fireworks that happened here so essentially my understanding is fireworks are illegal in the Netherlands but the police sort of turn a blind eye on New Year's Eve people like drive to different borders that we are surrounded with to buy an aggressive amount of fireworks and I'm not going to insert any footage because I don't want to trigger anyone with photosensitivity epilepsy etc that would not be cool but um so that's a very like homemade DIY version of firework displays. I think there are organized ones, but it is just mostly people setting them off in the street in their garden. And we, our friends live on the top floor of an apartment block and we sit out on their balcony and we could see across the whole city, like honestly hundreds of fireworks going off all at once. And it lasts about 40 minutes. It's like a spectacle to witness and like a very unique and strange part of living here, but I really enjoyed it. We. Um, we're here on New Year's last year, but I was extremely unwell, like bed bound, sick, ended up going to the hospital a few days later. And so we were trying to just sleep through it and it was really horrific. And we like, were like, we're not doing that again. But we ended up being here this year because obviously it's like a very expensive time to be in another place. Um, and actually watching it with our friends was so fun and they'd never watched it before. So they were just sort of like in awe of the whole thing. We stuck our heads out of their like skylight windows and watched it across the rooftops and it was a really cool and like special experience even though we were just sort of hanging out with our two friends and playing board games but it was like one of my favorite new years i've had we ended up staying out until about two o'clock in the morning because no one would let me go to bed because everyone wanted just kept saying one more round of scattergory so <laughs> that's what we did i also don't drink anymore so they were all having a merry time and i was just quite tired but it was worth it since then I've been really poorly which is kind of expected when I throw off my sleep schedule like that it does send me in so we did have plans to go with them on a new year's day swim but we ended up rescheduling that for this weekend which I'm really excited about anyway and I'm really sort of like grateful that they changed it because they said that they could go without me but they said that I was the charismatic leader of swimming which am I starting my own cult I'm sure but um Tom and then just ended up going to Amsterdam Bosch which is like the big forest outside of the city and went on like a big New Year's Day walk which was great for them and I ended up knitting this instead so this was I knit this on the last day of 2023 and the first day of 2024 it is of course another bonnet I just start this for a friend but I'm gonna keep it for myself because I'm just in love with the colors so much this is like a scrap bonnet I made with stuff that I just had around in my yarn stash this is an old pink one this is the green and the cream um schnaffneg i used for my friend's bonnet i think i showed if not on here on instagram and then this is a really old wool in the gang like chunky merino and i did an eye cord but uh for it but i think it obviously doesn't look right with this neckerchief but i think it's so cute um so i knitted that but then disaster struck because i started let me grab it. Oh, I'm wearing, still wearing my microphone. I hope you can hear me fine. I started another one for my friend who I originally made, was gonna make that one for, cause I realized I had enough pink and then I've got this leftover blue. I do have enough of the green as well. So the only thing I think that's gonna be different is it's gonna be like a darker blue cord. Um, I've also got this pale blue. So this is more of the color scheme of hers again using up scraps um but then i started to feel this pain in like the front of my shoulder which then moved up to my neck which then when i get neck pain i can really easily trigger a migraine so i've had to stop knitting so i don't know if that bonnet's probably the last thing i made for a while i did manage to find a physio that knows about my genetic condition which i know is what's causing this because i basically I, it's called, I never know how you pronounce it, sublocate, it's like semi-dislocate your joint, which I do fairly often, which is what I've done to my shoulder. So that's extremely painful, which has been getting me down, 
but I have been reading a bit instead, which is nice. Um, I've, I'm back at work this week, but sort of not a full week because obviously Monday was a bank holiday and Siska's coming into town. She's like passing through in and out of Amsterdam for a few days because she's seeing family here. Um, so that's really nice. We get to spend a couple of evenings together, perhaps a trip to the bookshop on Sunday, who's to say? Reading wise, I started this actually, we had a horrific travel day. I finished, didn't end up talking about it in the vlog, but we, if you saw on the news, there's like a flooded Eurostar, a flooded tunnel outside of Kent, which is the line that Eurostar runs on. So we were one of those thousands of people standing in the middle of the St Pancras station on Saturday morning. Um, many Ubers and a very expensive flight later, we did make it home, but it was a pretty stressful and anxiety inducing trip because I have not been flying for a while now because of COVID and being sort of extremely conscious of that. So having no choice but to get on a flight because there were no train tickets left for like three or four days and they were also extremely expensive um that was really nerve-wracking but touch word i'm testing negative ever since but anyway on that horrific travel day this was the book i put in my bag and sometimes you know you just need the push to start the book and this because this was the only thing i had with me i was like i guess i'm gonna start it um this is wellness by nathan hill i'm about this far in which is pretty good for me i think it's i'm on page 250 so i've like read a book already which always feels weird but i'm really enjoying reading a big book and i've really enjoyed reading it on the travel day so um i've been trying to keep up that habit of reading in the evenings because before christmas i was just like knitting frantically all the time so i wanted to pick back up the habit of reading and i have unfortunately been again back in a really bad bout of insomnia so i also read this between the hours of two and five in the morning which isn't great because it's kind of heavy um but this follows jack and elizabeth who meet in chicago in the sort of like renegade art scene living in these disused factories that are going to be done up we flash forward most of that phase to quite long into their marriage and they have an eight-year-old child and they're trying to buy their first house elizabeth works for this psychologist or like think tank based on psychology around the placebo effect and the but the business she works for is called wellness and it's about testing products um to see if they're real or placebo and sort of getting to the root of placebo and jack is a sort of adjunct professor flailing a bit in his career and you know midlife crisis unsure of where all of his life has gone and why he never became the successful photographer he planned on being um we've just entered the part where we're realizing how, before jack and elizabeth met what brought her interest to psychology and whether really they met out of coincidence or if it was planned all along and is their relationship really a placebo i don't want to give too much of it away because it is a very plotty book but i am really enjoying it and more so to say like the experience of starting the year with a really big book is really satisfying to me and even though i said in my wrap up like i read so many books last january and it's a good way to kick start the year actually this and like building the routine about reading this every day is feeling really good but like i said this is really heavy to read in the middle of the night so i did end up which i do sometimes read books on my phone on script now ever and um and i picked up one of the indigo press sort of short non-fiction books they publish all with the same blue covers as you can see here and the one i started actually i started this i read a bit of this in cornwall one night when i couldn't sleep but i've i finished it last night is burnt eucalyptus wood and this follows the author's experience of becoming an orphan age seven in ethiopia when her mother and her young brother die of aids and they die in a christian sort of like respite center run by nuns which then she is adopted out from there to catalonia and is raised as a like in a spanish family moves to brussels to do her masters and works sort of in various international politics un um the african union reuniting with her identity and her heritage and this book is centered on identity and heritage and she traces both what she remembers as a child and sort of a very traumatic and just like a, st a story that you 
that for me at least as a white woman being raised in the UK and Europe have only sort of read about in fiction or in more sensationalized news stories I guess but this she illustrates in the book sort of how she feels like she's really lived these two lives these the most polar opposite versions of existence being raised in rural Ethiopia with a, a mother and her little brother that would sort of like travel from place to place to try and pick up informal work and her mother was very unwell watching her mum die essentially and then being given this other life with middle class Spanish parents being sent to university in the UK living in Brussels and then coming back around this circle and mixing because of her work with middle class um, Ethiopian members of the diasporic community who had a very different upbringing in Ethiopia and therefore have a very different sense of what the country needs and has now. So she talks both from a personal point of view of yeah, her upbringing, the two versions of identity, the language, acquisitions of the places that she lived and then her like professional, I guess, ideas about um, policies and politics in Ethiopia and other African nations um, about colonialism and poverty and health policy and things like that. It's a very short book and I don't know if it's, I found this with a few of the Indigo Press books, I don't know if the tone always works for me of the writer, like it can feel a bit too colloquial, colloquial is not the right word, more just like there's a few sentences where she'll say I believe and I think which I feel like is a bit doesn't feel like as polished as to what's made in other longer sort of memoirs or books of this ilk and that's not sort of a comment against this book specifically it's sort of what I noticed about more indie published they're more essentially I guess like an extended essay as opposed to a full book if I was reading it on my phone and it was like 140 pages so in person they're like very slim and very small so I guess perhaps it's it informs to judge them against like a full length uh, non-fiction book on a similar topic that's my only gripe I would say but like the writing style doesn't necessarily always work for me but I did think the content was like I say deeply interesting and yeah just really just made me think a lot I guess sorry it's now got the sun's coming out but it's like hitting this is the plague of January and winter weather um yeah I just I did really enjoy it and I love the the title and how she circles back to that in the end of burnt eucalyptus it was really an evocative like sensory experience thinking about that title throughout the book you know the smells and yeah that is what I'm that's what I finished and then on audio I'm listening to this impossible city which is a book about um it's again actually like memoir with professional reportage but in a much longer sense um looking at it's the author telling her experiences of the hong kong like ongoing issues with land and housing and rental crisis like Mel did with her experience of the mental health system there and the her personal experiences of class um abuse growing up in abusive household and complicated relationships with her father I would say that I think the mental health aspects of this book reading it from a perspective of I guess it feels like she's framing the issues with the mental care system in Hong Kong as wholly unique and she makes also some passing comments about like the NHS being like a much better way of doing things and sort of the price of the psychiatry private appointments and stuff um, is framed as a uniquely, I felt like it was being framed as a uniquely Hong Kong um, experience of a Hong Konger, which I don't think is the case. And I did, I mean, I'm always, I think, brushed the wrong way when people reference the NHS as this like all seeing, all knowing power that saved so many people's lives and has sort of like is a flawless system that other countries should look up to. Um, I guess as someone who's thoroughly <laughs> used the NHS throughout my life, both for mental and physical, like chronic illness um can reject that I guess idea so I think I found that a bit frustrating but I think and I definitely feel like the ha the stuff on the housing 
crisis, the land matters, the issues, really interesting stuff about like the indigeneity of different groups living in rural parts of Hong Kong near the Chinese border and sort of the aggressive capitalistic um, oversight of China with the, in relationship to land and sort of the high speed rail and like plowing down buildings and all that kind of stuff is really interesting and the geopolitics of that region as well talking about you know the various process the umbrella process the 2014 process the security bill that passed in during the pandemic um all that kind of stuff she references as well in there and i really like there's like a set of chapters where she names them like flat one flat two talking about the different houses she lived in as a young adult which i liked as well so i'm probably got like two hours left of the audiobook of that so i'm excited to see where we circle back to I think that's enough talking i'm going i do have more exciting things to show you actually because i for christmas instead of getting each other like gifts for each other tom and i set aside some money to make some little changes around the flat we bought some new art i just ordered some frames for some prints that we've had sitting around and we got a bookshelf and a new lamp so the bookshelf is probably the most exciting and interesting thing to you and i'm excited to do it up so i don't know if i'm going to film the whole thing because i I'm quite tired and in quite a lot of pain. I'm probably going to do it bit by bit over the week, but I will definitely show you the final process and explain my thoughts behind it. So you'll probably see that next. friends long time no chat it's monday i just got back from physio and um cisco was here for the weekend or like she was like passing through on her way you're a bit wonky to see family because she's got lots of family who live here so that was so lovely we got ceremonies last night um finally reunited with my tempeh roti and did lots of chatting, watched the Paris Hilton documentary on Friday. Um, and what else did I do? On Saturday, I went to the beach with some friends. We rented a car, went to the sauna, made them swim in the sea. I'm not sure they're gonna forgive me. I actually didn't film any clips. <coughs> Briefly interrupted by the postman. Delivering, actually. Some picture frames we're doing, I think I've said a bazillion times, we're doing some small revamps to the apartment we've got some art over christmas that i want to frame and but i want to uh, diy the frame so i'll actually probably do that the weekend and i can show you guys i'm quite excited for it what else i gonna say what am i talking about sauna friends didn't really film us honestly really it's been a ride the past couple of weeks i have started these new drugs for my endo and really i think messing with my hormones and i just can't stop crying just waking up in the middle of the night crying going to bed crying <laughs> just like is that real like out of control feeling that you have about your emotions which i feel like is so intrinsically linked for me at least like feels like very linked to my hormones so that's something great i've also been having a lot of panic attacks which is so not fun and also so exhausting on your body like physically so that's been a little tough, but I have been, I started physio. Did I say that I went to physio today? <laughs> Can you tell I have barely slept? Um, I met my new physio and he was so nice. And um, physios can go a lot of different ways when you have chronic illness because some of them can be really quite laterally ableist and have some really difficult opinions about energy limiting conditions like ME, but he was really kind, Dutch, middle-aged man didn't have high expectations but 
he was funny, like really funny. We talked about politics, talked about the recent election, neoliberalism, climate change. It was a really interesting chat and he's gonna hopefully help me with my neck shoulder issues that have been going on since I dislocated or like semi dislocated it in October and that's triggering. I've made it worse by knitting a lot. <laughs> Speaking of which, do you want to see what I'm knitting? I started on the weekend a balaclava. It's going to be a three stripe, but kind of more. Actually, I'm now looking at this. I really don't want the red and green to be next to each other, but I think I'll put another pink in the next one. Um, not really like even stripes, if you know what I mean. They're interspersed. This is just the ribbing for the neck and then it's going to go into the balaclava. I'm really enjoying making it, but do I want to show you how close up my colour change? Something went really off the wall there. Um, and I completely forgot to do the jogless stripe in the first one. So then I just sort of kept going. I think obviously once I cast off to then start the hood section of it, I won't really need to worry about the stripes because I won't be knitting sort of entirely in the round. So that is a bit annoying. And also carrying up six yarns because it's I'm knitting with drops air double um, is making it a little messy on the inside. But this is honestly more of just like a, not just like I wanted, I had this vision of these colors in my head for ages, but um, it's also just a practice because I think I said I'm making all my friends like a piece of headwear this winter and I gave some at Christmas and they got like another batch from doing for spring and one of my friends requested a balaclava so I'm using this. It's a free pattern I found on Ravelry um, as a template. I did also start to do my German short rows on my jumper at the weekend but I got distracted because I was also doing the same time as talking to Cisco and Tom so I think I need to like review that better eyes on me um reading wise i nearly finished i haven't been listening to my audiobook of impossible city that much but i listened to a bit of it to and from physio on the tram just now and it was really interesting actually she was talking about journalism and her perspective on like expatriate journalism and um marginalized identities in the mainstream press being tokenized or approached as that sort of like model minority voice and um, that she experienced as writing as a Hong Konger in places like the New York Times and Washington Post and places that are driven by a Asian American experience um, and want to hear like a specific version of, of Hong Kong, particularly in relation to the protest. So I'm finding that section really interesting. We've left behind some of the mental health stuff and the housing and now we're talking yet yeah, more specifically about the protest, which yeah, it's really interesting. And now in the chapter I was just listening to as I was walking to my apartment, it was about um, the book and sort of like writing uh, the like politics of the language that she writes in and writing in English and how being raised in like the international school world, English as this universal language, people viewing themselves as global citizens, all of that kind of debate, I think is... Um, it's good and I'm, I'm on the home stretch of it as well so I feel like quite motivated to finish it in the next couple of days um, in between work. I don't know how much further, oh I'm over halfway I think. Hmm. I'm on page 350 of Wellness by Nathan Hill. I'm struggling to know how to talk about this because I don't want to give a, it like away or like give spoilers. So I guess if you're like so excited for this specific book and like you don't want to know anything about it then maybe um fast forward until I'm not holding it up but if you I don't think you can really spoil like a literary fiction book of this kind perhaps because it is quite saga driven and you're not necessarily like it's not a twist or anything it's just sort of like a uh, plot progression but we are now with Elizabeth as she's working um giving us more information about working at the placebo um lab and Perhaps we're indicated now that her meeting her now husband was less so love at first sight and more an engineered meeting through her job. So that's really sort of twigged my interest. They've just gone on a double date, Jack and Elizabeth, with another couple who are in an open marriage and participate in um, non-monogamy, both like together and apart and are talking about sort of their the sexual politics of their life and 
we come away hearing from Jack and Elizabeth separately about how they feel about that kind of stuff, which I think is also really interesting in relation to Elizabeth's work with love and romance. So I am having a good time with it. We've passed, we've now gone back to Jack's childhood, which I think is probably the least interesting to me personally. It's about his life in like rural Kansas growing up and being like from a red state and how he was bullied at school. Which I'm not saying I don't find that sort of interesting, but I think in the context of the book, I'm just so desperate to get back to present day. And I think it's quite common. I know Mara from Books Like Woe talks about this quite a lot in the thrillers that they read specifically. But I think it applies to really any book that has a dual timeline. Like it's it it often feels like one of the timelines is more developed and more you can almost feel the author's the author's preference for the timeline that they're writing and that sort of translates onto the reader as well as you having a preference for which one you're preferring so I do find dual timeline books specifically like when you're flashing back to the past and I think it doesn't help that I'm not a big fan of like child narrators and childhood books in particular um that you kind of want to skip over and get to, get to the present day obviously because it's also a very long book there's a lot of, you know, we're like spending several pages talking about one incident at school. It can be a little tedious, but overall I'm still finding it a really rewarding read. So that's the updates from me. Um, what else is going on this? We have like two free weekends. I'm sure like thing, small things will pop into the diary, but we don't have any like big plans for the next, really till the end of January when I've got um, a friend coming to visit. And I'm really looking forward to having some yeah, chill weekends, resting, knitting, crafting, doing DIY around the house, gonna sort, we have been actually quite good the last couple of weeks sorting out, like we did the, or I actually, I'll take credit for it. I did like our junk cupboard, I reorganized all my meds, got rid of everything that was like expiring or that was like a prescription I don't use anymore. Tom sorted out all our shoes. Um, I just listed a lot of stuff on Vinted. And the next project is, oh, and we put up our new bookshelves. Oh my goodness, I have to show this to you when it's a bit brighter out. But we did end up reorganising my bookshelves with Siska's help. Um, and I can explain to you what I ended up doing. Um, so that was another thing gone. I've just got a pile of books to take to the second hand shop, which is on Tom's job list. And then this weekend, I want to tackle the kitchen because our kitchen is tiny. I don't really film in that. Um, and it just has such terrible storage that we need to think of some more solutions. Does it help that I have a semi-excessive plate and mug collection that I buy on holidays to places where there's nice ceramics? Perhaps not, but you know, we'll have our vices. So yeah, we need to go through and sort that out and um, just free up some space, you know, be have things have a better home, you know. But I was really impressed with my junk cupboard because I put all of the like boxes we were using for storage and then I printed out little labels to say what's in each box and then Tom's like can you grab me a tape measure I don't have to get all four boxes down you know I know that's like so simple but you just live with dysfunctional processes I feel like in your home for such a long time because they just feel like part of the furniture you're like it's normal to pull out four boxes looking for one thing every week when I need to find something isn't it um oh and we had Tom and through all our tech cables and we got rid of loads of those so that was really good as well so yeah, we're slowly doing the January, New Year's start of the year cleaning processes, which feels good, it feels nice. Um, we also did our adult or part, we started our like financial planning for the year, which is always depressing. And our trip planning, which is also hard because we live abroad and most of our friends and family live in the UK. So we did planning for going back and there's got friends in my life who are having babies and getting married and like I want to be able to go to all of that stuff and organize my life and so I can be there for those big moments for people so put some stuff in the diary also did that with Siska which is good we got like our next few meetups organized not meetups but you know what I mean next times we'll see each other um one of which includes some wedding things for her which I'm so excited about um but yeah that's just long distance friendship working out when you'll get to hang out in the next few months so that was actually a good weekend overall despite the crying and the headaches so oh, the horrible ringing sounds probably my chance to go I will make sure to show you the bookcases before work tomorrow
friends, um, you're gonna have to excuse that there's no microphone attached to this because I'm too far away from you to plug one in. Um, cause mine's like plugged in through my phone. So this is gonna be a little haphazard, but hopefully you can see from afar and then I'll be able to zoom in. So this is my new bookcase. It's one of those sort of floating ones that looks like this. It's very pleasing. It actually fits more than I thought it would. So I keep most of my book storage you would have seen before in those big cubes, um, which can get looking really messy. And I actually had stuff on the floor, which I did not enjoy. So this has been great. Tom and I got it for Christmas, although, I mean, he reads a lot too. So I'm not gonna say it was just a present for me. He gets to read a lot of these. Um, I really didn't know what I wanted to do, except I knew I really wanted to put my Fitz Corrado books all together, like on the top. Besides that, I had no idea. So uh, when Cisco came today, we had a little think and I decided more to use this as my like bookshelf of collections of things because I don't tend to collect in terms of like a lot of the same author. A lot of the authors I like are sort of new contemporary debut authors writing, you know, one book every couple of years. Um, and I wanted this shelf to be predominantly books that I would reach for, books that are like talking points with people. I have a lot of people coming from borrowed books. So I wanted this to be organized in sort of distinct sections, but I knew I also didn't want to do like color blocking or anything that was too aesthetic. Like I wanted this just to look like a collection of my books, which it is. So I think we'll start from the top. I'm going to bring you up a bit and then we can talk from there. Your balance very precariously on the edge here, but I thought you should be able to see everything. Oh, didn't touch the dry flowers. At the top here, this is all of my Fitz Corrado, which obviously will grow over time. Um, I really didn't notice how many white books I had more than blue, which if you didn't know about Fitz Corrado, they're an indie publisher in the UK and they publish mostly, uh, they publish their fiction and non-fiction in two different colours with these very simple, yeah, this isn't a good example because this is the proof, but they're very simple. I really enjoyed them a lot. Mine are very dirty, which I don't really mind. Then I put together a collection. These are just my, these are all the same. Non-fiction books, orange, uh, penguin ones. We do actually have more than this, but Tom has his own bookshelf that keeps his academic books, like his work related books, and then his special interest books about football and music. So we do have more orange books in our collection, but I didn't want to start messing with his stuff because he uses it as a library for his um for being an academic you know so I didn't want to take them out of there but then I put all of my Miriam Taves books together which is so pleasing to look at she's my one of my favorite authors of all time and I can't wait these are oh I should also say this is all red books so I do have a few more in each category that I haven't read yet which then obviously will be moving around and I'll explain at the bottom how I think the shelf will grow and evolve but I love these. This is Miriam Taves' latest book, which tell me why publishers do this. I know this would have come out in hardback. This is a paperback proof, but it obviously doesn't match the theme of the rest of her books, which is obsessing. So I split it between the shelves. Then starting from Samantha Irby, all the way down to about here. These are all my books by sick writers. Um, so writes with disabilities, chronic illnesses. I noticed I actually have a lot missing from my collection because I do audio a lot of memoirs and memoirs like the category that disabled writers are overrepresented in. So there's a lot of books by us in there. Um, but it did make me think like when I get a book voucher in the future this year, I would like to buy myself books that I've listened to on audio that I can use in this. Um, category because I love having them all together it's obviously such a big important part of my life my work um and I love having them all here so we've got Charlotte Emily of Poe my friend Kylie <laughs> um which is really cool um disability visibility I've got I did mix in uh fiction here because I honestly only have a couple of fiction books by disabled authors that I love, loved enough to keep. So that's why Eleanor knows that's a book not by a disabled author, but about a disabled character. Um, Abby Palmer's Sanatorium, all of Lucia Osborne Crowley's work and my friend Katrina's book. Then going down further, I'm gonna move you. Okay, we're down further. 
um, from the refugees onwards. This is my collection of short stories. I love short stories. I have a really small collection of ones I love. To be clear, I don't keep all the books that I read. Like I get rid of a lot of them. So these are my most loved. Um, I do have Colin Barrett's newest work, but that is with a friend right now. Um, and yeah, short stories are another thing that I like view as a collection in my in my library so I like having all of these together and then the final category I got to about then that's when I was like I really don't know what to do like it ends a lot so I then decided to put memoirs on here these aren't all the memoirs that I own oh I think I need to move you down again hold on okay you can just as about see the bottom I think maybe not can you see the transgender issue on the bottom and my broken language but yeah I decided to put all my memoirs not all of them, but the ones I had and particularly the hardback <laughs> because partially out of convenience because the shelf was the shelf was starting to wobble, I think, because it was sort of I don't know, I it's I think designed to be screwed to the wall, but I'm not allowed to do that in my rental home. Um so I thought if I put some hardbacks on the bottom that would maybe stop it going so wiggly and it has. So these are just memoirs that I pulled out, mostly hardbacks, which is out of convenience, but also they're also ones that I like really, really loved. So see, I'm glad my mum died, Boyfriends by Michael Penson, which is one of my favourite books of um, 2022, My Broken Language, which was a favourite book of whichever year I read it in. Um, and these are the books that I think can be shifted around. So like when I get more Fitzcarraldo, I'll be moving everything down. Short stories and disability books I would love. I've read enough disability books to probably fill this whole thing, but I don't own them all. So yeah, that this category is not, it's a bit more nebulous because it's not even all the memoirs. Um, I wanted the bookshelf to have like more distinct, like everything on here instead of like short stories and then some short stories on my other shelf. So that's what I ended up settling on, but I think I will, like I say, move some of these. I also thought my big cube shelves, I'm just gonna move you back here probably. <laughs> I thought my big cube, I would free up much more space in my big cube shelves, but I actually haven't. So that's sort of a problem for me to think about and <laughs> getting rid of some books. I did pick out a few more to take to the secondhand bookshop, but I think for me, I need to think more carefully about sort of what I want my library to look like. Sorry, I'm gonna have to leave you there what I want my library to look like and sort of what can feasibly fit in the space because I, I hated how those cubes got so stuffed that I didn't even enjoy looking at them or using them. So I need to be more intentional, I think, about where I store my books and sort of if I don't, there's room in the house for another one of these, but I don't necessarily like it because we live in sort of one big room, our apartment here. I don't really want every space to have books in it, you know? Um, so I need to think a bit more about as I acquire more books going forward where and how they're going to exist in my home but then also in the back of my mind I'm thinking like oh one day I will live in a bigger space than this hopefully and I would like to continue having a library and Tom will continue to collect books for his work so I also don't want to just get rid of stuff that I will regret in the future um so yeah that's something to think about for 2024. But I think I'm gonna leave this video here, catch up with you next weekend. I'm gonna do some DIY and hopefully would have finished wellness by then. And yeah, hope you enjoyed this first vlog of 2024. If you're not subscribed, please do so. Leave me a comment if you've got a bookshelf like this and how you've organized it or any tips and tricks you have for your own bookcase storage. I would love to hear about it. Um, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.